You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show with your host, Brian Callen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Brian Callen Show with my colleague Hunter Motz. The Brian Callen Hunter Motz Show, I should say. And it really is. Uh, congratulations, Hunter. Um, oh my God, the honor. That's a truck in the background. Our guest <laughs> is white as shit. His name is Christian Lander. Sir Christian Lander. He's been knighted by myself. <laughs> Wrote an amazing book that everybody who's white should read called The Definitive Guide to Stuff White People Like, <laughs> The Unique Taste of Millions. And there's a huge thumbs up on it. I love it. It's Christian. also it's also not just for white people. If you're like black or Asian or Native American and trying to figure out the whole white thing, yeah. it's a really, really, if it's anything, just, it's written not how, to white people. How weird we are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's also, I mean, it's written as a guide to exploit white people. Yeah, well, as, as, well. as well it should be because I, I was in Portland, as I was telling you before we started recording this, and I swear to God, I was like, there's a uniform these people are wearing, and there is very predictable behavior. Mm-hmm. Coffee, mm-hmm. wine tastings, mm-hmm. uh, chocolate, mm-hmm. specific kinds of chocolate, fair trade, yeah. organic. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and, but, but please, please, sir, what caused you to write this? You're, you're a redhead. Yeah. <laughs> you're white as shit. Yeah. What, what are your, what's your nationality? Oh, well, I was born in Canada. Damn right. Oh you my were. God. So even that's later. even, that's, yeah. It's, uh, it's actually, her, it's horrendously white. Uh, yeah. it goes back. So my family, my dad's really big into genealogy, which white people love to do. And my yeah. dad's traced it back to the Mayflower. Wow. But the other thing was my family, as it went along, eventually sort of interbred with um, people who were very loyal to England. So during the American Revolution, my family were United Empire loyalists who, rather than fight, left the U.S., and left went New back York. to the, the no, motherland. moved to Canada. Oh. They came across the border up to Canada to stay loyal to the king. And so that's where my family is on my dad's side. On my mom's side, my mom was born in England. Uh, and Devon, so you do have an aristocratic bearing. Oh, they, well, they weren't really <laughs> aristocratic people, well, but I'll in, take it. In my mind, you you do. I mean, <laughs> we should be talking this way, of course. I'm Christian Lander, everyone. Um, tell us about the book. It's it's funny as hell. It's so, so good. The way I wrote it was, uh, I grew up in in Toronto, um, super multicultural. Believe it or not, like yeah. as, as people have a vision of Toronto yeah, as like the whitest there. place in the world. It's actually I've performed really there. It's great. Multicultural, and uh, you know, most of my friends are different races. And one of my best friends is Miles. Um, who wrote a couple of posts in the book? He's Filipino. Mm-hmm. And one day, you know, we were, I was at work. I was working at an ad agency. Miles was working at a video game company. We we're talking back and forth about The Wire. Oh like, yeah, why people love The Wire. One of the best shows of the of all time. Of course it is. Seen every episode. Yeah. Um, and we love the. And then Miles says he doesn't trust any white person who doesn't watch The Wire. That's it. Miles' <laughs> full statement. He's like, "There's no way they can't be trusted." And then we just started going back and forth about like, "Well, what are they doing instead of watching The Wire?" And we came back. It was like, "Oh, they're going to therapy. They're doing yoga. They're getting divorced." And I just and I was like, "That's it." And I started writing it on a blog. It's like it's blog time. I just started writing stuff white people like thinking it was only going to be a couple friends who read it, and then it just took off from there. Yeah. What What do you think it is about the fact that we? Drink. I mean, I don't know. I'm half Sicilian, so mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know how white I am. I, I don't feel as white. I feel way more Latin. Mm-hmm. And, and I also grew up all over the world. But personally, I, I feel way more at home in my places like Miami or around a bunch of Lebanese guys uh, or Israelis. Mm-hmm. I really do. I, I think I'm just I, – I definitely don't think I'm very white. Okay. Personally. Sure. But then again, love my wine. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I don't go to therapy. Love my wine. Mm-hmm. Love my chocolate. Yeah. I'm I'm a foodie. Of course. Well, Brian, uh, let's try and find out, are you white or not? Like, let's try and answer yeah, that let's on this do that. today's podcast. Let's do that. Let's it, do that. It, it shouldn't be hard. I mean, one of the things that is, is in the book that was sort of meant to be the humor is that white... I mean, I always make the joke, you don't have to be white to be white. You just have to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> because ultimately, all these people would come up to me, you know, these people would just be like, oh, my God. I mean, I'm Chinese, but I'm white. I can't right, believe it. Right, right? Right. It's like, no, it's it's as much of anything, it's a class thing. Yeah. And this is what was sort of going throughout the book and sort of one of the things that I've always thought is that there's – and this is – it's interesting you mentioned being Sicilian, sort of the history of immigration to this country and the melting pot and what's changed, yeah. um, you know, in the past hundred years was that when immigration came from Europe – uh, change a last name and one generation, and guess what? You're white. You know whether you're Irish, Jewish, yeah. Italian, etc., German, and all these people were you know looked down upon and and discriminated against for being these foreigners. But within a generation, could really become natural born Americans. And the immigration patterns of the country ha- are very different now. Yeah. So if you come to the U.S. from China, from Mexico, from Africa, anywhere else, no matter how many generations you've been here, people will still ask, "Where are you from?" And yeah. it doesn't have that same level of immigration. So white has really become, you know, the class the, yeah. the class idea of eventually getting wealth and moving to the middle class and becoming white is still very much alive. Especially the way we treat our animals, huh? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah I yeah. mean, anthropomorphic, you know, kind of traits we put on our animals. Well, I think that, 
I mean, an Obamacare for dogs would have passed a lot faster, <laughs> <laughs> without a doubt. I think that everyone would have been like, yes, of course, we should all support the health care of these dogs. Yeah. So, yeah, that's definitely what it is. I mean, and right now, I mean, the big white thing right now in dogs, I mean, I don't know how up to date you are on like white dog relationships, <laughs> but the new one right now is the service dog scam. We're pulling. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We're all over this. Dude, I was at my, my stand up in Portland in the front row. A woman who who uh, who I know who's great, but she had her dog, her service dog, it happened to have been a attack trained German Shepherd. Yep. Right, and the reason she said that the dog didn't really wasn't really kind, it was looking at me a couple times as I was jumping around. She goes, "Oh, she listens. To, uh, she, she's probably going to hear this. She listens to your podcast all the hey, time. Of course, so she's fine. But um, but she had a service dog thing on it for for we, emotional distress. I well, she wouldn't say she didn't want to say, say it in front of a bunch of people. But yes, it was. Pro- I don't know what it was for. But well, this, this was else, a highly trained. What shepherd. else do you get a service dog for? Well, it's really easy blind. to. Do. Yes. Yeah. It has oh, yeah. to be emotional distress. Yeah. So that's the only claim you can make if yeah. you can't, yeah. unless you're going to fake blindness yeah. on a plane. Which yeah. makes you a real I wish I'm sorry I'm blanking on her name because I'd like to give yeah. her a shout out. But, but she's an avid listener. And but she's yeah, great. That's, the, that's the new one is that lets us take our dogs into restaurants yeah. and HD Buttercup in Culver City. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking up her name. Keep and, talking. <laughs> 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 and that we're on. So, yeah, you know, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, our, uh, that's our big relationship. It's just been nuts to see the dog status has just and, gone and higher and higher. And I mean, English higher. people, I mean, since your mother's English, like English people I think I lived in England for 10 years they have a particularly weird relationship with their animals I mean they really like animals much more than people yeah as yeah. a rule I mean, it all, it all depends on what, what part of England you're in. Yeah. You know, I mean, who you're de- I mean, they don't really like foxes all that much yeah. if you're dealing with the aristocrats. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. Can you explain? This I is looked something- up Shepherd in my email so I could find out who this was, and I and I got this. Girls! <laughs> and freckled. <laughs> fuck their beer and their shepherd's pie, too. And fuck you guys. Mm, that's interesting. Right. <laughs> Never mind. Let's keep moving on. Sorry. But so, I mean, you know, even like, for example, the thing with wine, right? Like, yeah. you, you make the point in the book, lots and lots of people all over the world like wine. Yeah. But there's a particular way that white people like wine. And Brian, I think this would be a really good test for whether well, you're white or not. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I've spent um, a lot of money on Riedel glasses because I of like course. my wine. I like Brian, that's pretty damn white. <laughs> not only that, not only that, I get my beans, my coffee beans from a place called Cafe Lux, uh-huh. which has the best coffee. A friend of mine has a <laughs> special area in his very, very big house where he makes coffee a specific way with a hand you know, crafted espresso maker. Well, hang on, hang on. Let's. This is this is. A, we got a question here. Yeah. So you get your beans from Cafe Looks. That's great. Yeah. How do you grind them? Okay. Well, I I grind them. <laughs> I have a very expensive espresso maker. I grind. I don't do it by hand. Okay. I don't do it by hand, but it it, it grinds the beans in my espresso maker, and then I have actually read up on. You know, look, a good barista. Wait, you got all, have, Are you saying you got an all in one? I got an all in one. All right. I'm not that white. Not that white right now. Because, <laughs> like, ah! it's the whole thing with wine and with coffee is the whole thing. is like what white people do is it's like, yeah, everybody likes it, but we like it so much that we ruin it for everybody else. <laughs> like, you know that dude when you're a kid and you're, like, playing with G.I. Joes and you're like, oh, this one. He's, like, giving you the whole backstory on every character. Right. And he's like, oh, and you got to get – and he knows everything. You're like, this really isn't fun anymore. Yeah, yeah, We're yeah. We're like that with coffee. So yeah. it's like you're going to buy your beans. That's great. Whole beans always every time. You, you can't do the all-in-one because it's the old trick. You know what I mean? It does – Instead of having two things that do one thing great, you have one thing that does two things kind of (laughs) mediocre. So what you need is a burr grinder because you can't use the regular spice grinders because they heat up and they cook the beans. You can't use that. I can't. So you need to move to a burr grinder or a hand mill because the hand mill won't heat up the beans, causing the flavor to change. Fantastic. Then when you're going to the machine, anytime you're dealing with electricity, I mean, it's white people. We kind of, I mean, we love electricity, but we also love anything that's more like hand, you know, rustic and stuff like that. So you want to move to probably a drip over method, something like a Harrier. You're going to need to get the gooseneck, you know, kettle. And the AeroPress is personally my absolute favorite way to make it, but the Chemex is also pretty good. (laughs) But you got to get away. You got to get this away from machines. Let me get my hand down my pants. Keep All right, going. you got to get away from machines, man. You got to, you know, you got to really connect with the but, beans. But this is a of... recent phenomenon. This, this sort of idea of getting back to the earth, butchering the the entire oh, yeah. pig. Oh, yeah. Right mm-hmm. there, all these restaurants where you're sitting on reconstituted wood plank yeah. tables, uh, even communal tables. When did this happen? It started happening in, you know, very recently. Fairly. I mean, what, what's interesting about it is there's a weird. It's not ironic, but. In a, in a younger generation of white people, you know, everyone sort of says hipsters, is this desperation to, and I know you feel this way, but to reclaim some sense of a working class. Yeah. I mean, that's where the uniform comes from, the plaid shirt, you know what I mean? The American-made jeans turned up at the bottom work boots. Well, I talked to all these loggers who were like, these dudes don't have any idea how to swing an axe or work a saw, and these morons are dressing the way we have to dress. <laughs> well, there is, of course, 
a company in New York that does make like artisanal axes that are really just meant to be kept. They're great. They also make blankets. I have an extension cord from them that I paid forty dollars for. But yeah. they make artisanal axes. They make artisanal axes. Oh, Brian, so awesome. we may need to get you one for your birthday. Dude, I swear to God, I swear to God, I was like, I kind of need an artisanal. Yeah, axe. I can't remember the name of the company, but they also do. Um, they do these really great extension cords and all, uh, all of this sort of. Is it best bespoke yes. axes by Best Made Co? Best Made, yeah. yeah. Best well, do you remember the remember um, um, J- the Jay Peterman catalog? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, that that was where you know oh, Brian. everything they made was you know. There we go. Oh, so, so yeah, fuck. Best and, Made. <laughs> and I also particularly oh, perfect like for that, my killing spree. Well, and the fact that the bottom of the handle has like yachting colors uh-huh. or like it looks like a croquet pole or yeah. something like oh, that. Yeah, Brian, you kind of need that. And do they make a lot of stuff? They do um, some extension cords. They do these great uh, maps as well, sort of like vintage looking maps that you can just yeah. put up on your wall and they yeah. have a great one for Southern California that we have um, that's Incredible. just a big one of the region and just says everything is wonderful here right over laid I mean, over top it's you great. know you have money when you can spend you know extra uh, that much money, money on, on an axe, axe you will yes. never Spoke use axe but where it comes from is this sort of stuff with the axes and it's kind of a rejection I mean we've hit a point where we're just so everything is so virtual and everything is so mass manufactured that like the last things that you can really connect to that you can't order online is you know a hot cup of coffee so you, mm. you make it yourself or especially food I mean I'm a huge I'm a food obsessive so and so the move back and towards uh, food especially and all that cooking is this is an experience that cannot be done online this is an experience that can't be exported mm. this is a very physical and very present thing and so there's a real desire to get back to what we feel we've lost in a lot of cases, yeah. which is why artisan so bread, artisan bread, you know, all these things. I, I, I really, I have to say, I resonate <laughs> with that so profoundly. I, I, my friends call me the aristocrat because I can walk into a restaurant and smell it and mm-hmm. go, nah, don't like the way I uh, bread baskets. Now nah, I'm out. Yeah. I can just see things and I go, I, I, you know, you, you develop <laughs> very course. sensitive yeah. antenna. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a hundred percent with you on this one. I mean, like, but that's that's what it is. I mean, and there's also, and this is a personal thing on mine where it comes down to. For all that that's going to annoy other people, the pleasure that you derive from it is incredible. Yeah. You know what I mean? You've taken this thing that so many people will sort of just shove bread in their face and say, oh, it's all right. But when you can find – it's the same with coffee. You find the differences and the subtleties. It's, it's well, a real opportunity Well, wouldn't you say the Europeans haven't lost a lot of this? I mean, when you go to parts of Italy mm-hmm. – and you go to like the north or whatever the the, the bread they take yeah. their time Absolutely. with their food man they've they've never lost the importance of course things are mass scaled and stuff in, in a lot of Europe yeah. but but you know try telling in, like an Italian that you know their their bread is going to come from the wonder the, that in that package no way yeah there are a lot of places where they still make the bread and you see them in caves and the honey and everything is made the Absolutely. wine is you drink the wine that's made a mile away from you yeah. but there's a big difference there because I mean when you go to Europe yes they do an amazing job with the, making the bread but it tends to be like a single variety of like they'll really take their time to make a really great baguette or whatever mm-hmm. well they're Whereas, provincial that way yes. yeah but when you get when you go to america it's always about the newness you know it's always mm-hmm. about like oh this bread is actually mm-hmm. made with spelt or mm-hmm. you know this bread has like craisins and like yeah. you know single origin sunflower seeds and, and in that it or comes from having is. enough leisure time on yes yes yeah. Well, that's, to enjoy life. Well, that's the unfortunate thing about it is now you need a degree from Sarah Lawrence to be a lumberjack. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're like as if we ah, as if like where did you go to school? I went to McGill in Montreal. Yeah, of course. And then I went to Arizona Great for a Great master's school. and then half a PhD in Indiana. Wow. Really? What does half a PhD get you? Uh, <laughs> a writing job on children. Yeah, a, a wife. Like oh. I, I met my wife. Oh, that's in, great. In the grad school program, we dropped out. I just I hit a wall of academia. Yeah. I just couldn't go any further. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's like as if we didn't have enough as upper middle class white people. We're gonna take back all of the you know what I mean all of the working class jobs we think are cool yeah we're gonna we're gonna but pull that's right where back. that's where white upper class came from I mean, absolutely you know that this country was founded not not on, only on the blacks of you know Chinese and black and Latin people but it, but you know if you look at New York back in the day Irish and Boston mm-hmm. those places those were rough and tough dudes yeah. and gals who worked with their hands and you know so there is a tradition it's this yeah. this thing is very new for us yes but it's coming back in a way and it's more expensive now it's a lot <laughs> man is it expensive yeah. those, those pizzas and it's so goddamn good yeah I mean my other thing is I'm very the other thing is we've moved to uh, Made in the USA is now a, a vanity label you know, mm-hmm. something that's made in America. And I mean, I do my best, obviously, as like a you know conscious white person to try and buy as much made in America as I possibly can. But all, all that's left are like, you know, selvage jeans and yeah. you know, fancy made shirts. Well, and on Abbott Kinney here in Venice, you can have your jeans made. Yeah. At this, you can look like you work on a train in the 20s. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's all definitely aboard, the look we're going you got for. suspenders. Yeah. 
Yeah. And sometimes you go with the chambray shirts look a little bit like an ex-con, like an old-timey But ex-con. again, I draw the line because I want to be unique. Of course. And isn't that a white trait? <laughs> yeah. It's trying it's, to be special and yeah. unique. You talk, about, you talk about the origins of this, and, and it, it, it comes from white guilt. Yeah. The idea that we were colonialists. Yeah. So we deal with fair trade and organic, even though organic, you could never feel, feed the planet. Yes. Uh, on organic um, foods. It's probably actually destructive for the environment. A lot of people don't realize. Yeah, it all ways. depends in yeah. different ways. And all, I mean, like, well, that's the other thing you never want to point out is that without the agricultural revolution of the 60s, you know, millions and millions <laughs> of people would have died. We would have starved to death. Right. But we don't want to bring that up. Because it's, right. it's the thing we love as white people is the best part about fair trade and the best part of buying made in the USA and all the stuff that I do is that I can feel better that I'm making a difference without making any sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. You're paying a couple more dollars with, it, and it's any, and it's better anyway. Yeah, so I'm going to pay an extra dollar fifty for this coffee, and that fixes poverty. Mm. Good job. <laughs> You're welcome, Nicaragua. God, there's a there's a chocolate bar at Intelligentsia. It was nine dollars. There you go. And there was a picture of the actual farmer who <laughs> farms the cocoa beans, and somehow I was like nine dollars for a. I, I would never do that in front of some of my friends. Yeah, my buddy Dove Davidoff would be like, "Listen, man, you worship at the Catholic Church." I can't even talk to you. Nine dollars? He won't even go in there. Five dollars for a cup of coffee? <laughs> he just calls me. He just he just makes so much fun of me for being very white. And he, uh, uh, but 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 I was like, no, I'm supporting Juan. <laughs> of course. Juan. <laughs> but this is this is by what, the way, best chocolate I've ever had. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> because what you what you what you tasted was kindness. Well, That's yeah. the extra agreement and the money. There you go. Yeah, and the fact that you're an amazing human being. That's my accountant you, you was know. going through my my the amount of the way I spend money. He, he literally. You know, he just kept saying, it's all food. I mean, it's all food. I was like, I really like good wine. I know, but I mean, this is ridiculous. His voice was getting that high. No, it's a worthwhile investment. Yeah, I agree. Oh, wait, I, mean, I have I'm nothing like... to show. I All the money I spend, I got nothing to show for it. Everything I make, I spend. Yeah. And, all, and when I think about making a lot of money, I want to make a lot of money. I don't make a lot of money. I make an, a, you know, a good living. But I always think about making millions, and when I make millions, I'm, I swear to God, I think about just eating even better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I literally, my life would change in very little. I would fly first class, uh-huh. and I would, and I would, because uh, I fly so much, and I would drink just really good wine. I have yeah. a crazy wine cellar, and that would be. A, a, I don't drive the same car. Um, which would be a sensible car, good gas mileage and safe. Of course. Right? You well drive done. a Prius. Yes, Thank of you. course I do. So I'm very white so <laughs> yeah. far. Yeah, you're, I'm doing, very white. you're doing pretty well already. I, I definitely am very aware of the the number of black uh, backs, the colored backs, uh, the different colors of, of backs that, that I sort of rode in on as a uh-huh. white person. The math fell in my favor. I grew up all over the world. Mm-hmm. I saw people of co- who are different color than I was suffering or ha- who had much less than I did, uh-huh. not necessarily suffering. I was very acutely aware as a kid of how lucky I was to be an American, part of an American superpower, Mm -hmm. and to be white and American. I've never lost that. I've never, if I was black and American, I have a very different perspective. Uh, uh, So blah, blah, blah. The, The list goes on. Yes, so I'm very aware. I, I am very aware of my colonial my colonial lineage. Mm-hmm. Um, shameful. Even though I had nothing, to, I had nothing to do with it. I still feel like I have some shame. Um, I want everyone everywhere to be as well off as I am. Of course. Uh, I, I I eat, uh, but then I really don't sacrifice any of that for my taste buds. Yes, I gotta have. I, I have to have very fresh, very good coffee. Und- yeah, I rather understand. you try and figure out ways that you know your moral compass and your gustatory palate can align. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. it's like it, it, it's just being very aware. Yes, of course. I mean, it's it's, it's your awareness of. As a white person, it's like your obligation to be more aware of you know the process and the food chain and all that we go through. You know what I mean? The industrial yeah. food problem that we have in this country. You know, and you you know, and you want to make sure that all of the the meat you're buying is you know stage five. You know what I mean? Non crate. All you, you know what I'm talking about. All <laughs> Do that sort I of ever? Stuff. You mean grass fed? Of course, they're natural ruminants. Gra- yes, <laughs> they shouldn't be eating grains. Yes, not pasture finished. We're talking grass fed all the way up. Thank and you. you. And you, you know all of this, and yet I have this thing. I mean, I I have a lot of you know colonial problems and all this kind of stuff. And I'm an obsessive. Uh, I grew up in Chinatown in Toronto, so I'm obsessive about Chinese food, like absolutely obsessive. Are you? Every weekend, my wife and I go to the San Gabriel Valley, every single one, to eat. And <laughs> Wait I know a minute, I love this. So what you are go your to favorite this, places there? You go to the San Gabriel Valley. Every weekend. Okay, why? It's the best Chinese food in America, by far. It's not even close. Really? It's true. Better than San Francisco, better than New York. Nowhere comes close to how good San Gabriel Valley is. Valley Boulevard is the most delicious street on, on the continent, by far. Wow. It's incredible. Everything. Why? And, Why? Because they're just. Well, it depends. You, you have a variety of Chinese and Vietnamese food, and the authenticity is just is is 
it, it's remarkable. You know, yeah. having uh, traveled to China and having traveled to Taiwan, and the the, the quality that you get, it tastes just like they, they you're take over so much time in, in preparing. They the take food. time preparing it. They don't prepare it for a white palate. Oh. Which is always my disaster with Chinese food restaurants, right? Is once I see the vegetarian menu expanding, I'm like, oh, here we go. We're, we're done. We're finished yeah. here. It's not so, what be. is authentic Chinese and Vietnamese food? A lot of pork? It'll depend. A lot of pork. You're going to see a lot of parts that you don't usually see on menus. Chicken feet? Chicken feet, beef tendon, kidney, stomach, beef all that sort of Beef tendon, kidney, stomach. Oh, yeah. Beef tendon is one of the most delicious things in the world. I love Jeez. it so much. It's incredible. And so, every. So, and the San Gabriel Valley is huge. It's, it's absolutely enormous. This enormous population of, of Chinese, Taiwanese, Vietnamese, um, Malaysian, all living out there. And the food is just remarkable so we go out there all the time and yet these menus uh, i really it's very difficult to order their english isn't great and my chinese doesn't really exist so you order the menu but i can't check to see is this stage five beat (laughs) (laughs) so i have to suppress my like my white desire to know that all the food i'm buying is right because you know it ain't and then you know it's bulk bought and uh, yes cheapest vendor absolutely and let my white desire to be unique and authentic supersede that one God, yeah because i have to be white yeah well i have the other thing in the book where i talk about one of the things we like to do is white people is be the only white person around so i go into a white re- <laughs> i go into a restaurant like this That's fucking awesome. if i go into a restaurant like this and i see a white guy with no escort i don't mean prostitute i mean like an asian person with him i'm like okay i can handle this <laughs> Two unescorted white people in the restaurant. I'm like, done. I got to get out of here. here. This is the beginning of the end. But believe it or not, the number of times that happened, you think the SGV is only, you know, like a couple miles east of downtown. It almost never happens. Almost The only place it happens are dim sum restaurants because white people love dim sum. They're like, this is the Asian yeah, food yeah, I, yeah. I like. Yeah. Well, but Din Tai Fung, right? Don't Din get me started on like, Din Tai Fung. Yeah, no, get, let's get started on it. Tell us about Din Tai Fung. Din Tai Fung, so, all right. So it's soup, soup dumplings, one of the finest things in the world ever made. You know? And so soup, soup dumplings are a, a Shanghai specialty, which is, you know, it's pork. Uh, it's sort of a gelatinous. So they cook this pork down until it has the fat all around it. You scoop it out. You put it into a little um, wonton wrapper, tie it up, and you steam it. And then the, the you know the gelatinous stuff turns into a soup. So you have like this wet, amazing dumpling that you bite into and suck the soup out. Originally from Shanghai, but perfected in Taiwan by Din Tai Fung, which is originally an oil, uh, an, you know, it's all cooking oil. And so I remember I ate there, and I was like, okay. And what they're amazing about is the technique, the skill. So the thinner the skin is on the dumpling, the more technically proficient the chef is. And Din Tai Fung is the absolute best in the world. They figured out that it's 18 pleats per dumpling to make it perfect, and they've got it all down to a science. And <laughs> You're I, amazing. And I God. had it, and I was like, this the is... The greatest pr- podcast so far of all time. <laughs> Keep going. And I was like, this is pretty good. But the soup was actually fairly bland. And I thought, well, maybe this is just a victim of, of being here in Arcadia. Right. So my wife and I took a trip to Taipei, not just for <laughs> Din Tai Fung, but for other things. Oh, because you're rich. <laughs> yeah. So we took a trip to Taipei. Actually, cashed in frequent flyer miles. I fly a lot, too. So I, I cashed him in. We flew to Taipei to eat. Eat, right to eat at the night markets and all that food. So I went to the Din Tai Fung, you know what I mean? The flagship location. I'm like, let's find out. Let's see. And I ate it. And again, that soup was bland. It wasn't It wasn't the, te- the technical proficiency through the roof. But I was like, this really isn't that great. The best ones I've ever had were in Shanghai, a place called Jia Jia Tang Bao, the absolute best soup dumplings you'll ever have in your life. Incredible. But the best in Los Angeles, sort of a place called J and J. Actually, I don't know how much I want to tell people about this. This could be, <laughs> <laughs> as I'm saying it out loud, this is my, I, I'm like, he's oh. guarded <laughs> on my on this on our podcast. He's guarded about giving up his secret about soup dumplings. Yeah, but I'll give this one up. J and J on Valley in Prospect Plaza, probably the best soup dumplings in all of Los Angeles. J and J, J and J, incredible, love them. So, so what are your favorite? I put you on a desert island. Yeah, you what? And I give you. <sighs> Five different kinds of you can bring, you can bring um, seven different foods. Foods, yes. Okay, and it can be Chinese food. It can be. I mean, you know, we can. So when you say, do you mean like a single food so, so, item? So chocolate, butter. Oh, wine, oh okay. I gotta you know. make my own thing. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, it's a bitch. You can, uh, let me let me answer for you, maybe. I, I, I bring coffee. Oh no, I was gonna say one thing. Arsenic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not living with seven ingredients, man. You I can't gotta do it, do it brother. Yeah. I just, you got, ingre- it's uh, only it's only for a month. A month, okay. So we got wine. Yeah, but come on. Are you a wine guy? Yeah, I like wine. I like uh, I like beer. I like. All Are you a beer. Scotch guy? Yeah. Beer. You're okay. You're more Scotch beer. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I like wine a lot too. I yeah, like. But you're, you're more northern. You're not. You don't have the southern. No. You do well with grain alcohol. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, well, I don't so do, are you particular do about well. your bourbon? About your yeah. Scotch? Well, bourbon's. In, I like bourbon because bourbon's like, bourbon's the cheaper way to get in. Okay. You know what I mean? Like to that world. Because sure. right, if it, it, the top bourbons in the world, like the absolute best bourbon you can buy is like 80 bucks a bottle. Right. Scotch, of course. You know what I mean? The sky's the limit for yeah. the insanity that you can spend. So yeah. bourbon's a great way to get in. So I'm, I'm pretty good with that. So I'd bring, let's see. I don't know if I'd bring 
booze if I drink it too fast. I have to bring um, egg noodles, like proper, you know what I mean, like proper Chinese, really? proper Chinese mm-hmm. egg noodles. What is what is a proper Chinese? Well, you egg know what I mean, like thin. You know what I mean, like the thin, sure, chewy, sure. the proper texture. I'd have to bring that with me. Um, I'd bring Noor's uh, chicken soup stock. It's mm-hmm. a powdered kind that they use. Uh, it's really, really popular in China and, and Taiwan. It's sort of like the base. You, you love know? Chinese food. Yeah, I do. And it's like, this is the easiest one to bring with me because I can just throw the water in there and it'll be yeah. fine. Um, what else do I have to bring with me? I mean, once I have those, I think I'm pretty set for a little while. I'm just going <laughs> to bowl of noodles. Noodles and chicken oh, stuff. green onions, kimchi. So you, uh, love your, you love your noodles. I don't eat enough noodles. Yeah, I love them. It's so what basically, you just created the world's fanciest top ramen. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because what, what, what about the, the other white invention is gluten. Oh, that's uh, another one. You oh. know, the gluten craze, and it's bad for you. And, well, you this, is the, this is the best one of, of, of sort of white people stuff, too, is our... Our belief in alternative medicine oh, it's is, is absolutely <laughs> incredible. And it's such horseshit. It's it's, it's but, such horseshit. But here, here's I just the, read a book, a number of books. Uh, anyway, it, it always blows my mind. It's always amazing. Of like, as a white person, what what sounds reasonable to you? You're like, hmm, not vaccinating against a disease that's wiped out millions of people. No, no, that <laughs> sure that makes <laughs> yeah. sense. You know, I mean, we're willing to buy into this sort of stuff, and like, no, actually, I think this bark will probably cure the cancer that I have. I'm, yeah. I'm going to go with that one. Yeah. I'm just going to ignore because big need... pharma. You know, yeah. what I mean? you can't yeah. trust these people at yeah. all. And so we're so willing to believe all this, and we're the same way with religion. And so one of the things we have in the book is uh, religions our parents don't belong to are the ones that we're willing to embrace. Yes, you know what I mean. It's like oh, Buddhism, Kabbalah, sure, all of this. Yep, yeah, bring yeah, it. Kabbalah, all of it. Kabbalah, all Buddhism, all of it, yeah, all, of it all of it. But don't give me any Christianity <laughs> whatsoever. No. Judaism, reborn Jewish. Like, no, un- absolutely unacceptable. Can't right. do it. It's terrible. A lot of Jews, oh, if you, some of the great Rinpoches, some of the great Buddhist scholars now are Jews. Yeah, well, of I'm course. Start out as New York Jews. They're like, ah, fuck the Torah. I'm going over here to sit in a, you know. Even Bob um, Dylan went to that, you know, went to the Eastern religions and then just came back. And yeah. now he's like, fuck it, I'm Jewish. Well, it's like. No, in- now he's Christian, isn't he? Is he? I yeah, I think Bob Dylan missing. went Christian. I don't uh, know if he still is. But. All right. But yeah, and then, you know, some of the worst Buddhist scholars are uh, white dread college students. Christians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> They're the episode. But the amazing thing about Buddhism, too, is about how white people will go far enough into it. They're like, okay, I'm, I'm really I'm really digging all this. Yeah. What, what's this part about wealth? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the I, same I, thing with Christianity. I mean, you know, the, the Jesus was pretty clear on the fact that massive, massive accumulation of wealth isn't necessarily the most Christian thing. I yeah, mean, the, camel, know, the camel through the, the eye of the, the needle. needle. Yeah. The early Christians were communists. You know, uh, Ananias and Sapphira tried to oh, save yeah. some cash for themselves, and God struck them both dead instantly. Yeah. Doesn't get much clearer as a signal, uh, you know. Yeah, so that's why I sort of like the great white person excuse of saying that I'm not religious, I'm spiritual gets you out of all of those <laughs> times oh, of being attached well, to that, any sort of dogma. Well, that's the other thing, not wanting to piss anybody off, right? I mean, there's that, there's that, say, you know, uh, white people historically have been a pretty aggressive race. Well, uh, we're, um, what, but, we're, what we're like right now is, uh, do you have a brother? I don't. Okay, so I have a younger brother. Mm. And one of the things I did growing up was I would fight with my brother. Yep. And my record against my brother is like, 200 and oh and the reason <laughs> the reason it's 200 and oh was at around 14 my brother was bigger than me yep. and we had a fight and it was real close oh, so man. i retired <laughs> <laughs> i was like i'm gonna leave this undefeated that's it if we'd had one fight back then he would have destroyed me yeah and so that's where like as white people once we sort of like crushed everything else we're like okay now now we're yeah. now we're now that we've stacked the chips in the direction that we want it to go yeah. you know and that we control all of the coastal property we like and we have all the money now now it's time for peace now that now that i like this this you shuffle. know you go to these countries i don't like going to like i like we my my family wanted to go to the Dominican Republic for the third time. I was like, I don't want to go there. I feel guilty. Mm-hmm. I do. I don't feel good about the fact that on the prime real estate, all the coast, you go to Jamaica, yep. you go to you go to you know Dominican Republic, any of these countries, any go to Africa. Anywhere, it's all they, you're not seeing any black people on the beach, bro. Mm-hmm. They're behind the gate. Yeah, you're seeing white people and you know a rich rich Europeans. Yeah. Uh, and Americans. And yeah, I don't like it. Dominican. I don't like it. Big uh, destination for Canadians as well. Dominican's really bad for that, especially. And Canadians go to Cuba, and it's the same thing. Yeah, these co- where it's just completely walled off. Yeah, and yeah, I, I don't, I don't like, like it. Makes me no, feel bad. Not really my thing either. And that's the thing. White people don't like that. They want to feel good. They want to eat chocolate and, and a artisanal. Lot are, a lot of these are admirable careful, traits. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but you may have the wrong kind of white people rolling down there. You know what I'm saying? And oh. you don't. And so they don't care. You know what I mean? They could care less about what's going on right there. Right. But the good kind of white people who do it is they're going down there, they're doing a vacation and volunteering at the same time. That's right. That's Build a house. Yeah. Habitat for humanity. Yeah. That's Important good. Thing. You do if, that in your vacation, you're winning. That's right. Having <laughs> said that, there are a whole lot of white people who are not 
the white people that you write about. Yes, in this absolutely. That's right. what I call about the wrong kind of white people. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> well, what I also, that's what we call them. I, what, one of the things that I thought was interesting is, is that you said that Balky Bartokamus is not white. <laughs> yeah. Discuss that. How how is Balky not white? Well, I can't even remember why. I can't even. Remember you you all said my... you were talking about the episode of Perfect Strangers. Apparently, going to Wrigley Field is enough to turn you oh, white. Oh yeah, <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't white before he went there. There, yeah. After he left, done. He was white. Yeah, yeah. he was yeah, already yeah. white. Chicago has that ability. Yeah, especially Wrigley Field. Yeah, it's a magical place. It is a magical place of khaki shorts. Actually, and white, shorts. And white people. The, the kind calves. of white people we're talking about are not sports fanatics. They're not very nationalistic, oh. are they? One sport. Pretending to like soccer. That's what we're the best at. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a World Cup year. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, yes. get ready. Are we going to cheer for the African team with the cute uniform? Yeah. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. That's going to be our move. But then if you actually start talking to that white person about, you know, La Liga, Premier League, any actual soccer talk, it's like, whoa, I, uh, I, I got get, the scarf. Don't I got get, the, yeah, don't get detailed. I, I got the scarf. Where does the, where does the need to feel unique come in? Um, well, probably the part part of it is the way we were raised, obviously, yeah. I mean, especially generationally with your parents. Was, yeah. you, you were told that you were absolutely raised. We were not to, ignored. We were paid attention. Yes, to. we were paid attention to and told that we were absolutely unique and we were absolutely different. And that continues through college and it continues forever on. And it's this desperation. It also still comes from guilt. It's a feeling that you want this recognition. I'm one of the good ones. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And one that I have. I have worth. I have value. I am creative. I am. You know, I, I, I'm contributing to culture, and you want to have that feeling. I do. But it's also the show of being one of the good ones as opposed to actually being one of the good yes, ones. Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, it's like a tree falls in a forest, right? You yeah. know what I mean? It's like if I make a donation and it doesn't turn into a bumper sticker on my car, did then I even make a donation? what's the point, right? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a lot of the logic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's all competition. I mean, all of this, like you said before, and I talk about this a lot, it stems from leisure time. So much of it comes from leisure time. Yeah. Like, And to have the leisure time to care if your beef is stage five <laughs> raised requires leisure time. To, ha- to, to care about whether or not something's vegan requires enough time. Yeah. To say, I'm not starving. You know what I mean? Well, well, not- one of the, William McNeil, I think it was, wrote a book called The Shape of European History. And one of the things that – one of the reasons that um, – there are a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons that the Greeks, you had Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, was because, you know, Greece was a place where they could export wine, olive oil, and timber. Mm-hmm. And it allowed them to go beyond subsistence living. They actually had some time off during mm-hmm. the, the year, uh, the summers or what have you, to actually um, spend time thinking yeah. and sitting around and coming up with ideas of what is the meaning of all this. Yeah. And when your belly's full and the sun is shining, you can actually sit and say, what does this all mean? I don't know if I feel spiritually fulfilled. Yes. <laughs> when your belly's full and the sun, you have enough time to argue not whether or not you can still like a band after they've been in an Apple commercial. That's <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> What are the books white people read? The books white people read, well, here's the, here's the thing about it. So when you're talking books with a white person, it's a competition, right? And it works like this. Is We're going to talk about the books that we've been reading. If I've heard the book, if I've heard of the book that you're reading, I win, <laughs> right? You got to go obscure. You got to go deeper. And I got to force you into asking me like, I don't know if I've heard of that one. And then I'm like, yes, I got it. And then I just go, launch into a very sort of... <laughs> You know, Ain't that the truth? It's, it, you know, you, you, Unless, I mean, you know, but I mean, it's also like if you cite some book that is just like obscure and uninteresting, mm-hmm. like it, there's a real thing. It has to be like an obscure but important yes, book. Of like course. I have to be able to recognize that the book is like a book that I should have read. Yes. Right? So how, how wet are you, Hunter? Because you had a, a weird upbringing and you've read, you speak a lot of different languages. Well, I don't hand grind my coffee. I'll tell you that much. No, but, you're, yeah. you're, I should start. Yeah, you're more of a, you're kind of a, you're not as fancy. Are you? I don't. I don't know. I mean, you know, I went to Eton, Brian. <laughs> I mean, you know. Forget it. Never mind. <laughs> it's incredibly white. Yeah, I went to Prince Prince William's Prep School. Like yeah. that's pretty. You're white as fuck. Yeah, exactly. I yeah, mean, that's pretty famous. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and he's Dutch. Yeah. yeah. So you know, he's I mean, a giant Dutchman. I don't. I just you know, I don't. I don't express it through. I think we all express our whiteness in different ways. You mm-hmm. know, oh, yeah. I do. I feel guilty about our colonial past. Absolutely. You know, do I seek to define my individuality? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know. Well, no joke. You guys were definitely some of the worst. <laughs> not even in front. English, yeah, we had our problems. Let's not go there. But man, you guys love the slave trade. Oh, more the than Dutch. Oh, oh, no, God. no, no, no. Listen, let's clear this up once ever? and for all. The Dutch love money. Yeah, there we go. And they yeah. don't really. They've always been incredibly. I mean, the, the good side and the bad side of the Dutch is that they're incredibly agnostic about where the money comes from. So that meant that they had like one of the most liberal policies mm-hmm. towards Jews and things like that. They were like, you want to make money, we want to make money. Great. 
The downside of it is that they were the first people to uh, buy and sell slaves in the United States. Yeah. Um, so, you know. Had been going yeah. on a long time before that, that's for sure. Yeah. Slavery yeah. was something that has been around until very recently. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. the order of the day, in it fact. It was indeed. Yeah. For all societies. There's a great story that the uh, Dutch king and the Swedish king were standing side by side. And the Dutch king is doing a very white thing and talking about his spirituality and like how religious he is and all this sort of stuff. At a certain point, the Swedish king can't take it anymore. And he's like, shut up. Like, I know what your religion is. And he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a gold coin. <laughs> and he <laughs> says, this is your yeah. religion. Yeah. Like, this is the only God And in a way, know. that is very, that is what what, what the white people you're talking about that really yeah. actually is their religion well, no one but they'll never admit it never, never admit it no, no 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 so the thing about white people is we desperately want to find a way to help the world um, you know do the right thing be ethical be moral but still own a three million dollar house <laughs> god damn right <laughs> and we it's hard it's really hard to yeah. figure out how to do that we want to find out how to do that and so it's well, all, there's this need to simplify right be, in a, be a minimalist ride that so expensive beach cruiser that. it's so expensive it's so expensive it's amazing to be how much more expensive you need a safe neighborhood first of yeah. all yeah. You, we gotta knock down walls to be simple yeah. you gotta have very expensive hardwood <laughs> floors to be simple those viking ranges yeah that's very simple you know it's very expensive to be simple these days it's so much money and yeah it's, it's it's a difficult thing to balance. You got to stay clean and oh, yeah. shop at Whole Foods. Well, you also have to be careful what you clean with. You know what I mean? Like you got to make sure you're using Castile soap or you're using something proper. You know, you got to be <laughs> no chemicals from Dow. Absolutely not. You can't. You can't do just that. Just because they work. Yeah. I use crystallized deodorant. There you go. <laughs> oh, I always love. I have that joke. It, I, it I doesn't work to, either. Exactly. I was, I was trying to explain. I try, in the book, I sort of try to explain all natural products and non-white people. It's like we have a very long tradition of embracing products that don't work. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I do. Oh, this crystal should solve it. I clean with, you know, I've had acupuncture done. Yeah, we need an online quiz where we can, like, find out how white we are. It's right at the back of the book. Is it really? Just check it right at the back of the book. Oh, great. Boom, boom, boom. All in there. Yeah, it's like 150 things. You just check check what's on your list. What makes you, uh, on a serious note, Mm -hmm. you've read this, written this book. It's great. It's funny. What makes you mad about the world, and what would you like to change? What makes me mad about the world? Yeah. Um, well, a lot of things. I mean, the f- food is, is one. Yeah. I mean, our relationship to food in America really upsets me a lot. I think factory farming is the worst thing that's ever happened in this country. And I understand the policy that, you know, especially our policies that relates to corn in this country. Yeah. And I understand why Earl Butts did it. You know, it was to feed a growing nation. You had to do it. But what we've done with subsidies and what we've done with factory farming has, has made it insane to the point where it's cheaper to have a processed corn product than it is a carrot. That's right. And that makes no sense We've to me. We've created a toxic substance called high fructose corn syrup for children. Uh-huh. And I mean, again, I, under, I understood what the spirit behind why that happened was was a good one. It was mm-hmm. to, to, to keep food cheap so that people wouldn't starve. And, and, and Earl, Butts, Earl Butts was a child of the Depression. Absolutely. Like, that's what he's trying to solve. Like, he was like, yeah. I, I was hungry as a kid, but and you that can't, was the worst. But so. you can't predict yeah. what's, you can't predict, again, what, what legislation is going to lead to and how it's going to happen and what we've created is this, this bad system. So that always upsets me, sort of, especially factory farming and the, and the way we treat that world. I think that we can... The price of meat should go up to reflect what it really costs, you know, in terms of water, in terms of, you know, in terms of agriculture, all that stuff I think I think should be changed. So that that certainly upsets me. Um, I'm very upset with uh, a lot of the politics in the country, in the mm-hmm. U.S. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm blatant about it. I'm definitely left wing. I mean, born in Canada, American citizen, but I'm definitely someone on the left. I grew up in a, a neighborhood that was... Uh, working class and immigrant. Now it's gentrified to a point that I can't even imagine. Like my dad was a high school teacher. He bought our house in the late seventies for seventy grand. It's worth a million dollars now. Wow! wow. And it, it just, the neighborhood's completely changed. So, and I, I grew up with a lot of kids who were poor or kids who just had fled civil wars, who were fleeing you know poverty in other countries. And I saw the difficulty of being on the same street and the idea of like. I looked at the opportunity that I had in this one little house, and I went three houses down and saw the responsibility these kids had to take on in terms of caring for siblings, caring for parents, and the pressure they had to succeed and what it really meant. And I thought, it's sort of insane that we get to take the same tests, <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, it's, mm-hmm. that it's the same level. And so I think that it really upsets me in this country when I see people so unwilling to help the poor and people so willing to villainize the poor. How would you help the poor, though? That's, that's the hard one. Yeah. But I think we have to try, and I think that should be the goal of, of this country is to help alleviate poverty and do what we can to help. But isn't poverty um, 
less a factor of what you don't have and more a factor of the way people live, their belief system, their behaviors. That, that, that's where I think the disconnect is, this idea, well, let's take from the rich, whoever they are, usually industrious people who put mm-hmm. a lot of wealth back into the country. Sure. And let's give it to these people over here. The problem with that is that, first of all, rich and poor are changing a lot. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a moving river. You know, it's like some people, I know a lot of people had money one year and then they have no money the yeah. next year. Uh, and by the way, when you have money and you spend it on things, you you are employing other people. Yeah. And but, you know, so so that the economy works to an extent that way. But but it, it feels like I worry about the fact that the poor, um, whatever, there's a poor mindset for mm-hmm. some people. There, there's. There is a mindset with a lot of people I notice where they don't know how to be successful mm-hmm. because they've not been brought up with those techniques, that mindset, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. But when you're brought up in a neighborhood <clears throat> where the school quality is terrible mm-hmm. and you're brought up in a neighborhood that does not have um, you know, supermarkets that sell fresh food, you know what I mean, and have fast food and sort of set up these toxic environments that are that are all that all exist there, mm-hmm. it becomes very hard to see what success looks like yep. when you're trapped in a world like this. So trying to find a way to solve that, and I think the state of education, I think, is another thing that also really upsets me. And, and growing up in Toronto, even it's changed now, but my high school was this incredible place that had kids from the richest neighborhood in town, Rosedale, a bunch of middle-class neighborhoods, some housing projects, all came to one school, and the quality was good. It was mm-hmm. a really good high school. It gave you that opportunity. And here in Los Angeles, we, we don't have that. Yeah. I mean, it's very, I mean, it is very, very difficult for a regular, I mean, and I understand the challenges the educators face as well, but we have a, a real problem here to try and fix yeah. this. If you're not giving the poor these opportunities and the chance to attend a school that is of a quality that, you know, a rich white person would feel comfortable sending their child to, yeah. I, I think we have such a problem of equality and a problem to solve it, especially in terms of self-sufficiency. You know what I mean? If you're not giving me the tools to help myself succeed, what the hell else am I going to do? Yeah, what but, can I do? But I think what Brian's talking about is, is, yes, there are the literal physical tools and then there are the mental tools sure. to be able to take advantage of them. And, you know, if you look at, for example, because I, I work in education, I wrote a book for students. But the, um, you know, so much of the, the problem is, is that students don't use the resources they have. Yeah. They don't use their textbooks. They don't talk to their teachers. And, and fundamentally, the biggest problem that we have in education is, is that students aren't engaged. Yeah. You know, they, they have no reason to ask their teacher questions. They don't look at their mistakes. They don't look up the things they don't mm-hmm. know. They have more resources today than have than any generation has ever had in the past, and yeah. yet they don't use them. That's what I'm always fascinated by is I hear people talk. So much of it is not even uh, a, a question of changing the infrastructure. It's it's a question of changing the mindset. Yeah. You know, somebody was saying about Russia, Putin's not the problem. Putin is just an expression of the Russian mindset. Mm-hmm. You know, until Russians realize that they as individuals matter and they can make a difference. Uh, with, you know, and, and the ideology changes, mm-hmm. the, the, the ideas, the way you beat a bad idea is with a good idea. That, that's, that's the most important thing. Yeah. I mean, also in places like Russia and, and India and China, too. I mean, again, when we talk about the actual tools of infrastructure, the corruption in those countries is killing them to that's a level right. you can't that's even right. understand. That's because right. with, that kind of, with that level of corruption and no trust in the government whatsoever, nothing will ever get done. You don't and have that, any security, your own private property, your own ideas. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's one of the things that I think is so interesting that, uh, that gets swept under the rug, at least as a concern, is that I know everyone here in, in America and in the West loves to talk about how corrupt their politicians really you know, are. Yeah. But comparatively, not even close. Not Really, mm-hmm. they're not actually, even close. They're great. Not even close. And we don't talk about what effect this this has on the rest of these countries, and that and that mindset as well. And so, you know, I've I've been to China a bunch of times, and I've sort of seen some of the ways it works. And it's like it is going to be a huge struggle in that country forever. Yeah. To, to be able to hold on to their the wealth. The, the wealthy people all want to leave, again, because of this corruption, this inability to change. And so, yeah, and the mindset in Putin and all of that is until yeah. they can sort of solve the corruption problem. I don't think you're ever well, going to Well, it's a snake like, eating its own tail. Yeah. You yeah. know, when you start to realize that you're, you're, the KGB owns everything and, and the, the guys with the biggest guns and the best organized crime group is the ones that get all the spoils, until you realize how bankrupt that idea is, yeah. how it doesn't work even for them. Yeah. And that kind of happened in, in Latin America. I mean, if you look at Latin America, America, they were all military dictatorships. Mm-hmm. You can't keep killing your own people. Yes. To, is that that saying that, you know, I heard a therapist say that punishment doesn't change behavior, it just suppresses behavior. Uh, you can keep the truth down just so long. I mean, things pretty soon people go, you know, we need to start changing the way we think about things. Yeah. And, that's, and that's the thing is, is that, you know, I mean, if you look and at... And that's where this book comes in. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you look at what happened in the 1960s, I mean, you know, the, the dominant theory in the 1960s of how you, you know, develop countries, whether it's the United States or internationally, was big infrastructure projects, huge inflows of capital. You know, LBJ tried to build this great society. Mm-hmm. Places like Russia were all about building, you know, massive hydroelectric dams. And the problem is, is that, yeah, you don't have the cultural 
culture in place to be able to maintain them. And so within a few years, those projects have, you know, the, those resources have been destroyed. They've fallen into disrepair and all that sort of That's stuff. That's why I, I'm optimistic about the Internet and these kinds of things, even blogging and, and, and podcasts. You know, ideas are catching on faster probably than mm-hmm. they would otherwise. True. But yes we're also, no? well, yes. But I'm also, and this is just from my own experience, is, is watching the, what, what the internet is at least going to do to culture from now on, and especially books and especially writing. And for those who are inclined to read and those who are inclined to books, it's fantastic because guess what? You know what I mean? Google Books has you know, stored all these great books you can read. You can order from them from just about I mean, how easy it is. When I was a kid, how hard it was to get a book sometimes. Right. You know what I mean? Like interlibrary right. loan and blah, blah, blah. All that, all that shit. Now it's a Kindle. It's, so, it's the easiest mm-hmm. thing in the world. It's great. So if you're inclined to that, it's fantastic. <laughs> Another white thing. If you're not, Another white thing, yes, Kindles. Absolutely. And they even have white in the name now. Kindle yeah, paper, paper white. white. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Indeed. <laughs> but if you're not inclined to those things, what we're, we're going to end up with and what we're starting to have happen now is that all, all of our knowledge and all of our world experience, even though we have access to everything, mm. is just becoming this small, tiny circle. And you watch the way people browse, and what will happen is people will have about 15 websites they go to over and over and mm-hmm. over and over again. Yeah, that's YouTube, it. RedTube, uh, <laughs> UJIZ. Sorry, sorry. sorry that's, my, that's me, that's me. Keep going. You're RedTube, yeah. man. All yeah, right, yeah. Man. no, no, UJIZ. I, 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 I scan it. I'm not crazy. X, N, X, X. I got it all. Brian likes to hear all sides of I the like to just, porn yeah, it, I have issue. A, I have a spirit of discovery yeah. and, and, and <laughs> variety. I've gotten to the point where porn doesn't even do anything to me anymore. I'm like, what can I, I got to find something weird on these fucking, well, where's, that's a, the, where's that's, a video that I can really yeah. I'm such a fucking a straight sex between a man and a woman. Blech, what a bore. <laughs> it's I'm a, a freak. I'm so glad that didn't exist when I was 14, 15 God. years old. I mean, I don't even know if I'd be here. I, you know, I, I don't like, either. I don't know what I would have done. I, I, my dick would have just whittled away to <laughs> dust. <laughs> I would have just been dehydrated all the oh, time. All the time. Like, withered away yeah. like a mummy or one of those kings I, preserved I was a, a chronic masturbator to begin with. I yeah. can't imagine with the porn. Jesus. I mean, because I, at least I had to use some of my time trying to find the material when I was younger. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I had to use my like cunning. Like Dewey Decimal System. Yeah, stuff, you had to, you know? like, uh, and the other thing is, like, when you're a kid, you know, it's like you find a porno mag in the bushes. It was, like, the greatest thing in the world, you know? I found penthouse magazines in my grandmother's house under, but I think they belonged to my uncle. Dude, they were penthouse, and I used to lock myself in that, that room, and it was, like, Christmas in July, uh-huh. man. Well, I mean, I always shit. make the joke that... Uh, us, with, we were like Eskimos with a porno. We used every part of that magazine. Uh-huh. You know, you read all the letters. You know what I mean? We like, were like Eskimos. You know, we like we read the letters. You know, you jerked off to like the phone sex ads in the back. <laughs> yes. Like every part of that magazine was used. You read the shit out of you it over, the, over, over, and over and over and over again. The, the letters, the interviews, you got it all. And now kids today, it's like that's I what's wrong get, with kids today. They get everything, and it's like <laughs> no, know? this isn't what I want. Click, it's click, actually click, click. affected. I've heard, I've read some studies. It's affected the way girls and boys deal with each other because girls are very young and trying to they're doing what they think the boys want so they're doing these porn things uh. yeah and boys get bored and they have multiple sex partners they just keep moving on because well you know she's got a dent here when you were my age I'm 47 when I when first time you know through high school and even college I, when a girl was naked in front of me I wasn't looking at her imperfections no. I was like holy shit she's naked yeah like I didn't even notice you know the things that other people would. I was just like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. She's yeah. just naked. Absolutely. Yeah, Who has time to be? I mean, what? No. No. That's very, very disappointing yeah, to yeah. hear. So, uh, there but it yes, is. these are my concerns about the culture <laughs> moving forward for yeah. internet. Is that the ability? I it. And I mean, it is that whole. You know, the best place to hide a, a leaf is in the forest. Mm-hmm. And so we're getting to a point now where it's like the best way to release horrible government secrets is put it in the longest book possible. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, so That's I'm just right. worried that everything's available to us, but no one's going to care because they're busy looking at cats and jerking off. There was, <laughs> well, there's so much. And in some cases, well, jerking off to cats. cats. Yeah. They will care when it affects their ability to speak their mind, eat good food, yeah, but the send problem their children is, to school, uh, and regulate their body temperature. But the, but the problem is, is that what happens is, is that, you know, you erode the critical capacity, the ability to think that allows you to defend those rights. And then you suddenly find that you can't articulate. Look, George in such Washington a way, said know. men will invent laws and take their own freedom away from themselves. I think that he was the one who said it. But I mean, w- one of the good things about this, or maybe not, but, but the fact of the matter is, 
we've come a long way as a society in terms of protecting and furthering our biology. We're not we're, we're not having to worry about burying our own children. Mm-hmm. We have enough to eat, all of us, almost all. Most of us have a cell phone we can communicate. We want most of us own a TV or a flat screen. I mean, there are a lot of things, and I'm talking about poor people, rich people. Mm-hmm. Uh, people we're in not going to die in the street. I mean, yeah, so, so the fact of the matter is we are solving the big problems. Uh, bad diseases, smallpox and starvation, really suck. Yeah, really suck. Well, if we don't keep burying, vaccinating, they're coming yeah, back. Yeah, so. burying your child because they died of some terrible fever. Terrible sucks. Yes, beyond. So we've really solved a lot of these major problems: clean running water, mm-hmm. antibiotics, vaccines. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it just goes on and on. The internet. Th- those are those are pretty amazing. Food. The way yeah. we were able to talk about, you know. The kind of variety we yeah, have, absolutely, man. The end of marauding bands. Yeah, you know that's a great thing not to be yeah. have to deal with anymore. That's right. But you need a culture that maintains these things. The and end of marauding bands, <laughs> <laughs> which but is by the way the name of it. It's so true. Yeah, I like, mean, like the odds of a Mongol horde busting in here. <laughs> and those were very bad guys. Yeah, I, you know, I would have been literally obsessed about one thing, and that was killing Mongols. Yeah. I mean, I, that's why armies were like, we got to go into the Gobi Desert and figure out a way to store enough water to get these fuckers who are living <laughs> off their horses. Yes. They're tapping into their horses' veins. Yeah, shooting arrows mid-stride, <laughs> destroying yeah, us all. I know. And then, uh, you know, anyway. So uh, There's no doubt that we've come a long way, but, you know, the, the problem is, is that the mindset that creates wealth is not the same as the mindset that inherits wealth. You know, and yeah, and I think that's a good point. I yeah. mean, you know, there there's that great uh, Andrew Carnegie has a really great quote, which is that in America it's three generations from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. And you know, having spent time with rich people, there's an amazing difference culturally and mindset wise between the guy who f- makes the family fortune mm-hmm. and the guy who inherits the family no fortune. Doubt. You know, and I mean, I think that's what I worry about is is that essentially, you know, you look at the internet and all these sorts of things. We are more like the people who inherited that family yeah. fortune. We've inherited freedom. We've inherited a level of prosperity. And do we have the mindset to maintain it? Well, that was, what is it, Barry Switzer that said it? Uh, he was born on third and thought he hit a triple. Yeah. That's it. it. Like that's, 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 that's it. Absolutely. That's the worst attitude never, in the world I'm to have. I'm never, I ne- that never has lost on me, man. Yeah. It's never, I, I'm such a fuck up. I just was so, I had so, was so much scaffolding. Yeah. I had so many rails to hold on to on the way up, if you want to call this the, <laughs> yeah. by the way. And you Brian, are, you are and at the top. The, I am at the top of the gym. <laughs> but I do, I get paid for what I love to do. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm the, I was just rated the number one comic of, all time. I think that's the quote <laughs> in the New York. Yeah, that's what they said. So it's the New York yeah. Times. So they would know that's a white publication. They, uh, yeah, they referred to me once as preternaturally excellent. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't read that article. They actually but... did. The review of my second book. I'm just, I, I don't know. I mean, where'd that come from? <laughs> <laughs> did you get that? Yeah. Ah, that's I mean, it's like, I, you never forget something like that. Preternaturally excellent. I never forgot. It's like burned in. If I mean, the New York Times says that about your book, you better go read it. So it was like the greatest thing that, I mean, I I, I never forgot. I mean, They're it's painfully like, funny, dude. It's a lifetime. It's painfully it's a lifelong dream and yeah it sort of freaks you out the book is and now all there's left to do is to go to the San Gabriel Valley and eat truly authentic Shanghainese soup dumplings the white man the white man we're talking to is Christian Lander Uh, the book is the definitive guide to stuff white people know the unique taste of millions thanks for coming on the podcast yeah thanks for having me and the second book is also awesome by the way yeah yeah Uh, whiter shades of pale the stuff (laughs) white people like coast to coast from Seattle sweaters to Maine (laughs) Are you working on anything else? Um, yeah, uh, I've been working on Chosen on FX. Right. Airs Monday after Archer, and then uh, and then yeah, just you know TV stuff. Good. You know that is. You can come back literally anytime, <laughs> I, for real. Like we got to start having repeat guys like him. I agree. Just, I agree. Just to have. And on listen, the we'll bribe you to come back on with a bespoke artisanal axe. There you go. <laughs> oh yeah, great. I could use one of those. Yeah, it's great. Totally. Korea town's getting mad real. <laughs> It's getting mad. Why do white yeah. people love the zombie apocalypse? What is oh, up I don't, with I don't that? Even, I can't even understand. Yeah. That. I, I, what I is the deal? It's just like, no, I don't know. Is, I, it, is it the one place you can actually kill people and not feel guilty? Yeah. Maybe maybe that's yeah, what it is. I feel that's what it is. I, I feel it's it, like you can actually fantasize about the arsenal you'd use. Because you, if you get me talking on how I would defend against the zombie apocalypse... I get a little crazy about it because I know what weapons I would use. <laughs> would I, it be an artisanal I have my axe? Weapons. Oh well, no, 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 no. It'd be a, it'd be a katana. It'd be a real katana, <laughs> like a, like made in Japan, a samurai sword that 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 can cut. I'd have to learn how to really cut because you have to cut their heads off. Uh-huh. 
um, an axe is too hard to wield. You got to fight a bunch at a time. You yeah. gotta, it's got to be light but very strong, very sharp. Uh-huh. And then, of course, I would have a, a combat shotgun, um, what they call a street street sweeper, mm-hmm. with uh, probably double lot or or scatter <laughs> scatter. I, I'd have a lot. You got You got. You need a lot of would fucking you get the ammo. AA twelve. Um, you know the repeating. Shotgun? Yes, of course. Okay, yeah, uh, right. uh, yeah <laughs> duh. That's what I'm saying. That's why right, I call good. it the combat. Yes. I just want to make sure that the, yeah. Yeah, the fuck right. are you asking me? Um, <laughs> and uh, you and need you, a hand grinder for your coffee so that you had the energy to fight the zombies. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, yes, I would have that, <laughs> but I would also have. Um, I'd need a tower of some kind mm-hmm. that they couldn't climb up. I'd mm-hmm. have to grease it, and then I would just take uh, pot shots. I think I'd need. I'd need a. I'd need a long rifle too. I'd need a. Uh, I need a fucking long rifle. Fifty I need cal. Too powerful. Don't you don't need that much firepower. Um, Just dealing with numbers. And the bullets too heavy, and at the, and you need a sound suppressor on. It's too loud. Uh, I would have probably your regular Win Mag three hundred, the kind of thing I've shot deer with. Um, but I need I have need you a shot big deer, magazine. Brian. I've shot three deer in my life. Were you wearing flannel um, at the time? I was not. I was wearing. Um, it was so fucking cold that I was wearing a shitload of down <laughs> and heat packs on my body. There you go. Yeah. I like the I like the warmth. I'm, yeah. I have a fo- I have a cold phobia. Oh yeah, I'm Canadian man. It yeah. Rolls right off. <laughs> you stud. <laughs> First thing I thought of when you walked in, Christian, I was like, the man's name is Christian, and he's not temperature sensitive. <laughs> I used to live in Montreal, man. The water would freeze in my eyes. Oh, it's so fucking cold there. <laughs> oh, it's so cold. Beautiful women. Oh yeah. Beautiful women. Wonderful. And you're a beautiful man, Christian. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, you make the world a, a very funny place, sir. <laughs> so thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to go have myself a microbrew. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Let's go find ourselves a gastropub, should we? <laughs> after my boxing lesson and after I look at a house in a gated community there you in, go. in Calabasas, I might buy. <laughs> oh, wrong kind of white people. No, where you're looking for a house, Hancock yeah. Park, Highland Park, you're right. Silver Lake, Echo Park. You're right. I lived Abbot in Venice Kenny. for 17 years. There you go. Do you teach classes? No, no, on being you should. White shit. I mean, you know, I, I think Brian and I would like to sign up. You know, I want to be less white. I want to be more edgy, which is See, that's white, which is white thing to do. Which is even wider. Rejecting yeah. whiteness is something we really it's try to do. It's a very white thing to do. I wish I could grow yeah. dreads, but I can't. My you hair don't, sucks. No, 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 don't become a white dread. They're my no. mortal enemy, man. We'd be, we'd be over at this point. That's too far. It's way too far. Yeah, don't far. go that far. Can't stand it. It's like, because you can only, white dreads only exist in places where there's not enough black people to keep them in check. <laughs> so, like, liberal arts campuses and, like, Edmonton, Germany, Canada. And Germany, yeah. And yeah. Edmonton. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're a stripper. Uh, <laughs> oh ladies and gentlemen, God. this has been another fantastic hour. I hope you learned everything. I hope you learned everything. <laughs> oh, my God. Was that a Freudian slip, Brian? Yeah, I hope you learned everything. And, <laughs> Things uh, white people don't I'm going to be love. doing stand-up in, uh, in Vancouver, speaking of very oh, white. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, April 3rd, 4th, 5th. I think we're, we sell out really quickly, which is exciting because I'm super funny. Where are you going to eat? Um, what did the New York Times You're going to have to give me – I want your – got to tell me where you where, where you got to go. Van- Vancouver, you got to get the Jabba Dog, the most famous – you know, street food in Vancouver. Japa dog? Yeah, it's like a Japanese hot dog. Dogs. It's great. And then the other one is uh, Vidges, the uh, Indian restaurant. It's like sort of seen as the best Indian Been restaurant. Been there, ate there, loved it. Then yeah. So those would be my All two right. for Vancouver, my two big ones. Done. Done, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it first. Christian Lander. You want you want to know where to get the best ethnic food? You go to a white guy. Like <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show with Brian Callen. Be sure to like him on Facebook. Just search for Brian Callen Comedy. And follow him on Twitter. Just search for at Brian Callen. You can also find him online by visiting his website. Just go to briancallen.com. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye-bye.